There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthandmedia.com forward slash feed. Well, a week of generally weaker than expected economic data was punctuated by yet another better than expected non-farm payroll report. And this comes despite the fact that earlier in the week, the ADP private sector payroll report came in slightly below estimates that 201,000 jobs added in May also 5,000 manufacturing jobs lost the third consecutive monthly decline in manufacturing jobs. These are the important jobs. Not only are they higher paying, but they're productive. And they also lead to exports, which improves our balance of, of payments. But the official number, which came out Friday morning, the consensus estimate was 220,000 jobs. And that followed the 223,000 jobs that was originally reported for April. Well, the actual number, according to the government, 280,000, 280,000 jobs created in May, far exceeding the 220,000 jobs that had been forecast. So it's a beat uh, by 60,000 jobs. They had a slight downward revision to uh, April to 221, and they upwardly revised March somewhat. So overall, uh, more jobs than had been anticipated. Now, the unemployment rate did drop, or increase rather, to 5.5%, as a few hundred thousand more people re-entered the labor force, which is bucking the trend. The labor force had been declining. Now some people have come back to the labor force. In fact, the labor force participation rate is back up to 629 from 62.8. Remember, the lowest it's been is 62.7. So at 62.9, we're not far from the low. And certainly there is no indication that the trend has changed. Of course, a lot of these people who have re-entered the labor force don't even want to be there. Remember, when we're talking about labor force participation, when you look at older people, right, workers in their 60s and 70s, Participation is at record highs. It's younger Americans, Americans in their teens, 20s, and 30s. That's where the participation is at all-time record lows. And a lot of the older guys who are now in the workforce, who were not in the workforce uh, before, don't even want to be there. Right? They'd rather be retired. But unfortunately, they can't afford that luxury anymore. So they need jobs. And of course, a lot of them don't even want full-time jobs. They want part-time jobs. And so a lot of these 200,000 jobs that were created are in fact part-time jobs, and they represent workers who would assume not even work in the first place. But of course, a lot of these older Americans, they don't want full-time jobs. So it works perfectly for them. I mean, they don't want full-time jobs for a couple of reasons. One, You know, they want to at least be semi-retired. They don't want to work 40-hour weeks. They're just trying to work enough to make ends meet. They need to pay their bills. So if they can do that with a part-time job, that's what they want to do. But also remember, when you're over 65, you're getting Social Security. But as your earnings, if you get a job, of course, you still pay Social Security taxes, right, even though you're collecting Social Security. But, you know, at, at some point, As you earn a certain amount of money, you start losing your Social Security benefits, which acts as an added marginal tax. So people on Social Security may want to work a little bit to get just enough money to make ends meet, but they don't want to earn too much money where they end up paying a very high marginal tax because they start losing some of their Social Security benefits. So that's also, too, part of the whole illusion of the strong uh, jobs reports, because all through the week, and I'm going to get into some of the economic data that came out, but I'm listening to all of these analysts and strategists 
who are basically saying, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense given how strong the jobs market is. And certainly that got uh, more uh, weight following Friday's report. But they're saying, given how strong the labor market is, it doesn't make sense that GDP is so low. It doesn't make sense that productivity is falling so much. It doesn't make sense that we don't have consumer spending, that we don't have industrial production, uh, we don't have output. And so they think that all these other numbers must be wrong. There must be something wrong with the methodology because we know from the jobs report that everything must be great. Therefore, all the other data that's bad, there must be a problem with it. It mu- we, we need to go back to the drawing board and change the way we measure things like GDP because for some odd reason, all of a sudden, these other uh, methods of computing data are wrong because they don't jive with this great jobs report. You know, it doesn't dawn on anybody to think, wait a minute, we have a multitude of reports that say that the economy is weak and we have this single report that says that it's strong. Instead of thinking that that single report is the one that's right and all these other reports are wrong, doesn't it make more sense that all those other reports are wrong and this one loan holdout, this one outlier, that's the one that's wrong? And in fact, it is the one that's wrong because the jobs numbers aren't strong. All these jobs that we're creating do not reflect economic strength. They reflect economic weakness. When older workers have to come out of retirement, right, to take a part-time job, that doesn't reflect economic strength. That's a problem. When you have companies transitioning their workforce from full-time employees to part-time employees, and by the very nature of the transition means that the number of people they employ goes up, that is not a good thing. The fact that people who want full-time jobs are first forced to work part-time jobs, that is not a positive thing. The unemployment numbers, these job creation numbers, are only superficially good. All you have to do is look beneath the surface to realize that there's a problem here. In fact, another good indicator of this problem is the weekly unemployment numbers, right? These numbers came out again during the week, and claims are up slightly, but we're hovering at 42-year lows, 42-year lows in the number of people filing for Unemployment. Now, I've mentioned this in podcasts before, but all the experts are saying this is a sign of how strong the labor market is because nobody is getting laid off, right? Very few people, right, are getting fired. So we must have this great, healthy economy, a great labor market. That doesn't necessarily flow. See, I I believe that a strong labor market is going to have a large number of people getting laid off. I mean, think about it. If this is the fewest number of layoffs in 42 years, does anybody think this is the strongest labor market in 42 years with labor force participation as low as it is, right? Uh, with salaries uh, and you know raising as slowly as they are. By the way, we did get a beat there in the in the report. Uh, wages, you know, aver- average hourly earnings up three tenths. The forecast was up two tenths. The prior month was up one tenth. So we missed it by a tenth last month. We beat it by a tenth. So it averages out to to being to being the two tenths. But given the the weak increases in wages, given the proliferation of part time employment when workers prefer full time jobs, right? Does anybody really think that this is the strongest labor market in forty two years? Yet we have the lowest layoffs in forty two years. What is the real reason? Well, I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again. If we are hiring a lot of people, if businesses are really hiring a lot of people, they're also going to be firing a lot of people. You know, a lot of people don't work out. In fact, a lot of employers, when they hire somebody, there is a transition period, a temporary period. Maybe you have a 90-day probation or something where the employer gets a better chance to observe his employee in action, right? Because you hire somebody, they might be a bit of an unknown quantity. You take a chance. You're not really sure if they're going to work out. So you bring them on board a temporary basis or something. If they don't work out, you fire them. So if a lot of people are being hired, then a lot of people are going to be fired. Also, when you are firing a lot of people, 
in many cases, you have to rehire people to replace them. If you're firing somebody simply because they're not doing a good job, right? You still need them. You hired somebody because you need the worker, but you have to fire that worker because he's not doing the job that, that you thought he would do when you hired him. Now you got to hire someplace somebody else. So in a vibrant labor market where a lot of people are being hired, you're going to expect a lot of people to be fired. So the fact that we're not getting a lot of people being laid off today means that the hiring numbers are suspect to begin with. And I've always said that because many of these jobs that the government is claiming were created, they have no actual proof that they were created. They just assume that they were created by businesses that they assumed were started during the month. But what if the businesses that they assumed got started didn't get started at all? What if businesses actually shut down rather than started up? which means there were layoffs uh, instead of people being hired, although I guess those layoffs would have shown up in the, um, in the numbers. So it's probably more a failure of businesses to get started that the government just assumes are being started because the government assumes that the economy is much healthier and much stronger than it really is. So they're assuming that businesses are being formed that are not, in fact, being formed. And again, if you look at the quality of the jobs, that the government does assume are created, they're in leisure and hospitality, right? They're in restaurants, they're in hospitals, they're in education, uh, they're in temporary work. I mean, these are not goods producing jobs. A lot of the higher paying jobs, you know, in mining, in oil and gas, we lost those kind of jobs during the month. You know, related to that, we did get a not as awful as expected uh, April trade deficit, the trade deficit, did drop to just $40.9 billion. But remember, it was like a record high the month prior when you X out uh, the crude oil. But the drop in exports didn't happen for a good reason, or the drop in the trade deficit. It happened not because our exports surged. They were only up 1%. It was because our imports plunged by 3.3%. Now, why did Americans import so much less stuff? Is it because we started producing this stuff ourselves and so we didn't need to import it? No, because our industrial production, our output is declining. It's simply because Americans couldn't afford to import that, to buy that stuff. And so we didn't import as much. And that's despite cheaper gasoline prices, right? Because consumers have to deal with rising rents, rising food prices, rising medical costs. You know, I just read the other day that the price of eggs in the last month has more than doubled. Now, you know, a lot of this has to do uh, with uh, the bird flu and the fact that a lot of these chickens are no longer alive. And so if they're not alive, they can't lay eggs. But that still is going to pinch the consumer in that egg prices are higher. And if consumers are going to eat fewer eggs for breakfast, they're going to have to buy something else instead of eggs, which is going to bid up the price of whatever they buy with the money that they no longer use to buy the eggs that they can no longer afford. But consumers are getting squeezed from so many different angles that there's nothing left over for discretionary spending. And so we are importing less. So everybody is focusing on this great jobs report. Again, it's the jobs report that's the outlier. It's all the other economic data that shows just how weak the economy is. And again, the jobs report is only the outliner if you accept it on face value. Once you scratch beneath the surface, you realize just how weak the American labor market is. And that's consistent with all the other economic data. Yet despite that, everybody is saying, oh, this means we're going to get rate hikes. I mean, maybe June is back on the table. Uh, There's no way June's on the table. But now they're saying, oh, maybe it's going to be uh, September. Look, even the IMF came out this week and urged the U.S. government for reasons that they don't really comprehend or for the wrong reasons. But the IMF said, hey, don't raise rates until uh, 2016. Well, you know, they're going to get that risk in that the Fed is not likely to raise rates in 2015, but they probably won't raise them in 2016 either, unless, of course, there is already a currency crisis that forces the Fed's hand. But I want to go over some of the other negative economic news that came out during the week that is being ignored because everybody wants to pretend that the real story is the 280,000 jobs created. And by the way, you know, Canada to our north created uh, about, what, 55,000 jobs or something like that in the same month that we created uh, 280. Now, in Canada, Canada has roughly 
one tenth of our population, right? I mean, maybe it's closer to uh, one ninth, but it, you know, let's, the math is easier by tens. They created 58,900 jobs. That's the exact number. We created 280,000. I mean, in order for us to create proportionately the same number of jobs that Canada created, we would have had to have created over 500,000 jobs during the month. So even though the 280,000 number is bigger than was expected, in, this, in the grand scheme of things, it's still not a lot of jobs, even though most of them were just made up by the government. But let's go back and look at some of the other economic data that came out. Personal income and spending on the month. In particular, personal spending was flat. Income was up a bit, but personal spending was flat. That was below estimates. Uh, we missed uh, estimates for now five of the last six months when it comes to personal spending. So why are Americans spending less? See, people are scratching their heads. Everybody has all these jobs. Why are they spending less money despite these jobs? It's because the jobs are no good. Either they don't exist at all, or to the extent that they do exist, they're low paying. Because income was up and spending was flat, savings rate also continued to tweak higher. Again, this shows that you know overly indebted, income short Americans are doing what they can uh, to hunker down and repair their balance sheet. Also, we got manufacturing PMI for May. It dropped just slightly, but it didn't increase, right? No rebound. It dropped to 54. It's now at the lowest level since January. New orders rose at their fastest pace since January of 2014. So more than a year ago. Where is the spring bounce? It's not coming, according to the uh, manufacturing PMI. We got April factory orders. They fell by more than expected, 0.4%. Year over year, orders are now down 6.4%. And this is the sixth consecutive month that factory orders have been down year over year. Now, that has only happened in America during a recession, right? So now we have something happening with factory orders, supposedly when the economy is strong enough for the Fed to raise rates. But what's happening now is something that we've only seen happen during recessions. So maybe that means that we're actually in a recession, which is quite possible. Remember, the government never knows about a recession until after the fact, right? The Great Recession of 2008 began in December of 2007. Yet in August of 2008, seven months into the recession, the Federal Reserve did not even have a recession anywhere in its forecast. It thought everything was going to be great, even though it was already a recession. In fact, the first quarter of this year, right, we had so far, the government estimate is minus 0.7. But as late as February 15th, the consensus estimate among all the experts, including the Fed, was that the first quarter, first quarter, and this is in mid-February, there was plenty of snow on the ground. Everybody knew about the bad weather in mid-February. The consensus was for the first quarter to grow by 2.7%. They missed it by three full percentage points. It didn't grow by 2.7. It contracted by 0.7. And they were halfway through the quarter, and they still didn't realize how bad it was. So is it possible that this quarter could be just as bad? Maybe. But they're never going to know it in advance. Also, mortgage applications fell sharply on the week. 7.6% decline, led by a 12% decline uh, in refis. And that's going to continue because uh, mortgage rates continue to follow bond yields higher this week. So there's going to be another big decline. I mean, pretty soon the refi market is going to be completely gone because nobody will be able to refi, uh, especially if the Fed raised rates, which is why another reason why they're not going to do it, because uh, people need that refi lifeline in order to keep their economic uh, necks above water. Uh, Let's go to the May services PMI. That came out this week. It fell to 56.2. That is also the lowest level since January. No bounce. This is a May number. And worse, The ISM non-manufacturing index dropped to 55.7, dropped, and this is the lowest level of the year, lower than January and February, right, when we were blanketed by snow and cold weather. But probably one of the worst pieces of news that came out was the revision to first quarter productivity. 
Now we know it declined by 3.1%. 3.1 was more than what we were initially told. That is a big drop. And remember, this is back-to-back declines because we also had a decline in the fourth quarter of last year. Now, that hasn't happened since 2006. And the time before that, I think it was maybe the early 1990s or something like that or that we had back-to-back quarterly declines in productivity. But that is a big deal. Productivity is plunging. Also, I I talked last week, corporate profits plunged 5.9% in the first quarter, the biggest drop since the financial crisis of 2008, and we didn't even have a financial crisis. So what's the excuse? Also, not only did productivity collapse, but unit labor costs surged by 6.7%. And it's not because wages surged by 6.7%. It's labor costs. See, labor costs measures whatever you have to spend to hire somebody. But a lot of the expenditures don't actually benefit the workers because it has to do with the added costs of hiring people, right? And of course, it does include uh, fringe benefits like health care. But as far as the worker's concerned, it's the same health care. It just costs his employer more to provide it to him. Ultimately, all that has to come out of his wages because he has to uh, be productive enough to offset these costs. But if you have plunging corporate profits, you have plunging productivity, surging labor costs, what would a rational person believe is likely to follow? Layoffs. It has to happen. How are companies going to restore profitability, especially if the Fed were to raise interest rates? Because that would be the kiss of death, because not only would their labor costs be surging, but their debt costs would be surging. And corporations have record amounts of debt. And so you raise interest rates. Something's got to give. How are they going to restore profits? And, you know, they're employing all these people, but they're not very productive. Right. They're not, you know, because productivity is going down. Layoffs have got to come. And I think the Fed knows this. I think the Fed knows that a reversal in the job market would immediately follow any kind of rate hikes. That's why they've been so reluctant to hike rates in the first place. Here's another interesting little survey. I mean, it's not that significant, but I've been talking about it because of the record that we now have. I mean, maybe this is going to be like the the, the Joe DiMaggio record for baseball and in, in hits in consecutive hits in games or hits in consecutive games, however you define it, uh, because this little uh, measure, it's the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index. And it just fell, and it's a weekly measure, and it just fell to 40.5. And that's the lowest level since last November, November 2014. But what's more significant than the actual level is the fact that this is now the eighth consecutive week where the measure has declined. Now, that hasn't happened in 30 years. And in fact, it's, you know, it's never happened because 30 years ago was the first week that Bloomberg introduced their Consumer Comfort Index. So in the entire history of this index, which dates back 30 years, the only time it's ever dropped for eight consecutive weeks is now. Now, a time where everybody is saying that all of the Fed's Stimulus has finally worked so well that after six years of, of, of patience, they can finally raise rates. Yet here's the consumer in distress, uh, me- a measure of consumer confidence dropping for an unprecedented number of weeks. Now, we'll see what happens if they can extend this streak for a ninth week. Uh, and I'll talk about that probably on a, a future podcast. Meanwhile, the markets did not necessarily react well to this good news. The Dow continued to decline. It closed the week back below 18,000, rather considerably below 17,849. NASDAQ still hanging in there above 5,000 at 5068. But a lot of downward pressure coming on the market. Remember, profits are plunging, productivity is plunging, labor costs are rising, and everybody thinks the Fed's about to raise rates, and the stock market is already trading at over 18 times trailing earnings, you know, one of the highest valuations in the history of the stock market. I mean, not the highest. Also, margin debt, the amount of money people have borrowed to speculate on on rising stock prices and now at a record high, higher than it was before the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. So a lot of reasons to be worried about the stock market. I think it looks pretty toppy, 
but I don't think it's going to crash because I don't think the Fed's going to raise rates. In fact, I think they're going to save the market with another round of QE. But if I believed, if I actually believed, like everybody else, that the Fed was about to embark on a tightening campaign, I would not. I would want to own any stocks. I would have sold everything long before May. I would have gone away a long time ago. But you know, I don't believe that. Although I don't really own U.S. stocks anyway. We own foreign stocks. The dollar was generally stronger on the week, although it did end on a down note against the Canadian dollar based on that very strong Canadian jobs report. The euro finished off the week positive, right, despite its about 1% drop on Friday. And why was the euro so strong during the week? And in fact, not only was the euro strong, but bond yields were surging across the continent. And this is another example of Peter Schiff being right about something. But the news that came out this week was that European inflation came out stronger than expected, right? And the ECB acknowledged that. And what did I say when the, when the ECB launched its quantitative easing program? I said the only thing they would succeed in doing would be raising the inflation rate. But I also said that I thought by next year, inflation in the Eurozone would be so high that they would have to call short or ter- terminate early their quantitative easing program. And I still believe that is going to be the case. Because remember, the Eurozone doesn't have the wiggle room. They can't move the goalposts on inflation. They have to keep official inflation below 2%. They can't even let it hit 2%. It must be below. And it still got has a ways to go. But I think that with the uh, resumption of the uptrend in oil, right, and if oil prices continue to rise, and they're hovering around $60 a barrel now, I believe that by next year, you're going to see that 2% level hit, and then the Bundesbank would have to force the ECB to retreat from its quantitative easing program. So just the fact that all of a sudden inflation did pick up, got people nervous, bond yields went up. I mean, I think the Bund got back up to about 1%, the 10-year Bund, which would have been negative, had been negative. Uh, The yield pulled back a bit since hitting that peak, but we're up substantially from where we were. And this is just on a smaller than expected increase or an unexpected increase in the official measure of inflation. This is just getting started. So that also, of course, drove the euro higher uh, and it still held on to gains on the week, despite surrendering some on the enthusiasm for the, uh, you know, superficially good non-farm payroll report. Gold was down on the week. Uh, I think the strength of the euro paradoxically, and the idea that maybe Europe won't be doing as much QE because European inflation is picking up and rising bond yields in Europe and in the United States probably pressured gold back below the 1200 level. We're now uh, below 1180. But my anticipation would be all of the buying that always you know, comes into this market, whenever gold manages to get below 1200, I believe those buyers are still there. Because I do not believe that quantitative easing is coming to an end, uh, certainly not in the United States. And I don't believe the Federal Reserve is going to be raising interest rates. Those are the factors that have been suppressing gold. But when reality rears its very ugly head, they will be no more suppressant uh, because the sellers will be gone and the buyers will be out in full force. Hey, by the way, if you haven't had a chance to watch the brand new video I just posted of my conversation with Mike Maloney, make sure and check it out. You can do so directly at www.shiftgoldsilver.com. That's www.shiftgoldsilver.com. Don't forget to watch it today. Hello, this is Peter Schiff. I bet you didn't know that without silver, you wouldn't be hearing this podcast right now or be able to use a computer at all. From laptops to smartphones to TVs to speakers, virtually all modern electronics use silver to conduct electricity. Did you know that the average solar panel uses two-thirds of an ounce of silver to function? And the solar industry is expanding dramatically, not just in America, but in booming developing nations like China and India. Silver is naturally antibacterial and is used extensively in modern medicine. Silver coatings are being added to breathing tubes, bandages, catheters, and other medical instruments to reduce the spread of infections. When antibiotics fail, 
silver still works. I believe the 21st century will be the century of silver. As fiat currencies continue to collapse and new uses are found for silver every day, the white metal strong industrial demand and low per ounce price will make it increasingly attractive to savers around the world. At today's prices, people of any age and background can afford to buy some silver. Learn why silver is a smart and reliable investment in my free special report, The Powerful Case for Silver. Visit shiftsilver.com and download it now. The Powerful Case for Silver includes information about silver's amazing chemical properties. It also explains why I believe silver may outperform gold in the coming years. Download The Powerful Case for Silver and educate yourself, your friends, and your family about the white metal. Just visit shiftsilver.com to download my free report. That's shiftsilver.com.